<laughs> well, welcome everyone. I'm delighted that you're here. I'm very excited about it. I don't know if all of you heard, but this morning we've been doing a Clear the Clutter for Christ around the church. Uh, we've made an, some amazing changes, uh, and then we all had lunch together, and now we're here to talk about, after you get rid of the clutter, what are the, some of the things that you want to do with it. So I'm glad that you're here, and uh, I hope that you'll find it meaningful in, in a variety of ways. I uh, was going through, my mother died about a year ago, and I was going through her stuff, and I found a copy of the very first brochure that I ever did, which was 34 years ago. And there it is, and I was thinking about it and realized, isn't it interesting that what's in the middle? Nothing. Nothing. It's nothing. Space. <laughs> and I have been passionate about helping people eliminate clutter from their lives for 35 years. And that clutter is physical clutter, digital clutter, emotional clutter, and even spiritual clutter. And so we want to talk about all of those, all of those things today. You have two handouts. Um, the first one is called the Home, Ar Home Organization Scorecard. Uh, for individuals and we're going to talk about that and that will be a way that you can go back and actually make some progress. You cannot change what you don't measure. For 35 years I've guaranteed my services. I've said to clients, when you hire us, and I say us because there's a whole group of certified productive environment specialists, we've got a couple of them here today, um, and uh, we guarantee our services. And I've said to people, if you come back five years or ten years from now and you say, this was a big waste of money. I'll either fix it or I'll refund your money. It's because my goal is to give people solutions. And a solution means not just physically organizing the stuff. Unfortunately, there's a lot of organizing consultants. That's what they do. They go in and they, they look at the stuff and they, they sort it and they label it and they color code it and make it all look pretty and they walk away. And then what do you think it looks like six months later? Same. Exactly the same. That's exactly right. And that's because it was about thinking that it was about the stuff, but it's not really about the stuff. It's really about the people. And so today I want to give you some, some of, of principles and practices that you can apply wherever you want to organize your, your life. And then you also have another handout. And this is really, this five-step process is something that we use with everything we do. And I hope that this can become a language uh, for you to use when you're trying to get organized. So let me go over it a little bit. The productive environment process. First one is state your vision. So when anybody says, I need you to help me, I need you to say to do what? <laughs> and then whatever that is, it's like, okay, what's your vision for what? If you organize your closet, if you organize your life, if you organize your business, if you organize your email, if you organize your briefcase, if you organize your filing cabinet, uh, what would that look like? And that's where we always want to start. So I want to invite you today to, I want to stop for a minute and spend some time for you to think of one thing, one particular thing in your life that's disorganized that you'd like to organize. There may be others, but I want you to think of one. So that as you're listening to me today, you can think about, okay, how do I apply these principles to that one thing? And it could be your kitchen, the clutter on your kitchen counter, it could be your garage, it could be your bedroom, it could be anything, it doesn't really matter. And one of the things I always tell my coaching clients is, at the beginning of a year, I ask them to name one thing that has to happen in your life for you to feel happy with your progress. And often it's lose weight, or get rid of the clutter, or whatever. Whenever you have that one thing, it is crucial that you have a plan to be working on that. It doesn't mean you have to get it done. It just means you need to know what the end result would be if it were organized. So that's starting with the vision and then have an active plan that you are actively working. Because here's the reality. If you have that one thing that you think, you know, you think about it when you wake up in the morning, you think about it when you go to bed at night, it comes during the day, and you don't have a plan, the negative of that rolls over into everything else in your life. 
But by the same token, when there is that one thing and you do have a plan and you're actively working on it and you can see progress, even if it's not huge progress, but if it's progress, the positive of that will also roll over into everything else. So for the purposes of the exercise today, you don't have to pick that, you can pick that one thing. If you know what that one really big thing is, go ahead and pick it. But you don't have to, you can pick anything. Because what's important today is that you understand principles. Because if you understand principles, then you can apply it to all the other things. Now what I'd like you to do is I want to stop long enough for you to fill this out. I don't want you to agonize over it. I want you to fill it out partly because it'll help you think about what are some of the things that you might want to work on. And then I want you to think about what is the one thing that you would really like to work on today you know what is the one thing today that you'd like to leave here because what I my goal for today is that you will leave here with a specific strategy in mind for how you can approach whatever that is that you want to organize does that make sense all right so I'm gonna stop right now and you take some time to fill out the scorecard and then write out what your one thing is Somebody asked the question, what if I like the way I do it, but I don't like the way the other person does? <laughs> Notice this says, oh, I'm so glad you asked this, Debbie. This is for you. Not for anybody else, for you. And in fact, I had a very interesting experience this week. Um, we were hired to go to help someone organize their home, and she came to us and said the big issue was her husband. You know, it's like I've been married to him for 48 years, and I'm just, I'm just tired of the mess. I picked up after him for a long time, and then finally I just got tired of picking up after him, and then her mother came to live with her, and it just got very complicated, and she said, now it's, everything's just gotten out of control, and it's just terrible, and I just can't stand it anymore. So we went in, and the first thing we observed was that he didn't have really as much clutter as she did. <laughs> now, his was uglier because it was sporting equipment and tools and, and things that, that weren't pretty. Hers were little knickknacks and, and collections and, and just stuff, 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 stuff everywhere. And when I was writing this book, Love It or Lose It, Living Clutter Free Forever, I did a lot of research on what is this issue around clutter. And one of the things I discovered, well, first of all, it's always easier to see somebody else's than your own. And it's always easier to clean up somebody else's other than your own. Because you don't have the emotion. And that was, in the case of hers, all that stuff was her history. Well, it is with him, too. So it's easy for her to look at his stuff and say, oh, you don't need that. It's just as easy for him to look at hers and say, you don't need that. Because the emotion is not there. Now, sometimes you have people, I'm sure some of you have seen the hoarder shows, and those are the extremes, of course, where it even gets dirty and all kinds of stuff like that. And I'm not talking about that, because that often involves, not always, but often involves mental illness. But there are people who have, there are many people, and I'm sure you all know somebody whose life is really hampered because they don't have anybody come in their house. They don't want anybody to see it. You know, they don't, um, they just don't want anybody to know what their life is like. And as I was doing research for the book, I discovered that if I ask enough questions, I could always find out that that person had at some point in their life experienced a severe emotional <coughs> loss. I said that, that, they, that if someone has difficulty letting go of things to the extreme, if I ask enough questions, I can't think of a single exception when I wasn't able to identify a severe emotional loss at some point in their life. Live through the depression, uh, past childbearing years and never had a child. Uh, one of the men that I met said to, that his clutter started at age 55 when he lost the job that he loved and never found another one. And so then things began to, to clutter up. I said that at a, I was doing a book signing in New York City at Barnes and Noble and a young man in, probably in his late 20s walked up and he, he said, um, my apartment is so full of stuff, I haven't had anybody in it for months. He said, every night I go home and say, okay, tonight's at night, I'm going to clean this up. And he said, I start to clean it up. And he said, the only, it's mostly paper. And he said, the only space I have that's flat is my bed. And so he said, I start sorting the stuff on my bed 
And he said, I become physically paralyzed. And he said, there are nights when I can barely get into bed because I have all this stuff. And then he stopped and looked at me tearfully and he said, my mother died when I was six. He said, are you telling me I have to deal with the grief of losing my mother before I can deal with the clutter? He said, I can't answer that. I'm not a mental health professional, but I can tell you what I've observed, that when people begin to see the connection, that, that it's more than just stuff, that's very helpful. I said that at a convention one time and a woman walked up to me and she said, well, you just saved my marriage. I said, wow, that's a pretty dramatic statement. What do you mean? She said, I came to this convention with the intention of telling my husband to whom I've been married for 13 years that I was leaving because his stuff is all around. I can't clean it. I have allergies. It makes it dusty. And she said, it's just driving me crazy. And he won't do anything about it. And she said, his mother died when he was seven. She said, I never realized before that it wasn't that he wouldn't throw it away, but that he couldn't throw it away. So I tell you that because it's a very important thing to know because if there's somebody in your life that's having difficulty with that, the more you tell them to throw it away, the more they're going to hang on. So what I said, I said to her, may I make a suggestion? And she said, of course. And I said, go home and say something to your husband about, I never understood before how important all of this was. Let's figure out how to keep it. Now, I stayed in touch with her for, I don't know, six or eight months afterwards. It dramatically changed everything because suddenly he felt heard. Suddenly he realized that it wasn't just this constant fight. And then they, she, and she began to help him figure out ways that he could. And then when she did that, then he began to say, well, I guess I really don't need that. And then it began, I'm not going to say it was a miracle. It wasn't a miracle. There were a few miracles. Uh, but it was improvement. It was an improvement. So I tell you that because it's really important for you to know that. Because if there's somebody else, you have to start with yourself. And in fact, many, many times, people will hire us and we'll go in. And the first thing they want to do is do somebody else. I say, uh-uh. So when you fill out this scorecard, you're filling this out for you. I'm married to a man who's a retired Army colonel. And I thought that all Army people would be very organized and Whatever. Well, I found out that's not true. <laughs> and the first few years we're married, I tried to make our house look the way I thought it should be. Because after all, oh, if I can't even organize my own husband, I'm obviously a failure. Finally, I just gave up. I said, I can't do this. <coughs> and so we identified certain places that are his, and you know that's the way they are. But I remember that in the beginning, I really tried hard to make him do it. And it just simply doesn't work. You cannot make anybody else do it. And I remember one night I was working, we lived in Raleigh at the time, we were building a house out here. And I came in and we were in a kind of small house and I'd been with clutter all day long and I was just craving some order. And I walked in and there's, I don't know, four pairs of shoes and piles of magazines and newspapers. I just wanted to scream. And I heard my mother say, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> so I didn't say anything at all. I went straight back to my bed. Because whatever I would have said wouldn't have been nice. And I looked at my bedroom and I was like, hmm, let's see. There's the makeup on my counter that I didn't put away from getting dressed this morning. Those were audio cassette days. There was piles of audio cassettes by my bed because I listened to them. Piles of books, I'm always reading four or five books at once, so they were all there. Two or three piles of clothes on the rocking chair, and I started cleaning up my own stuff, and I discovered a very interesting thing. My anger dissipated. And I had a huge aha. And I realized that when I was mad at him, I was really mad at me. And I said to him, I realize now I have enough trouble coping with my own stuff. I am just FYI, not a naturally organized person. I had been diagnosed with ADHD. I love the big picture. I don't like details. I love to start things and I don't like to finish them. And I can make a mess faster than anybody you've ever seen. <laughs> so what I'm teaching you today does not come from a naturally organized person. This comes from someone who has learned to do it and who works at it every day of my life. It does not come naturally. And what I told them was I realize now 
that when I get angry at you, the reason is because I'm having enough trouble coping myself and you kind of push me over the edge. And that was real helpful to know that. And so now I really focus on my own. So when you fill out that scorecard, you are filling it out for yourself, not for anybody else. So thanks for asking that. That was really important. I'm glad. So does everybody have kind of one thing in mind that you could be working on? Everybody got one thing? All right. So let's talk about the big picture in general. You came to this seminar because it was five strategies for organizing your home. So let's capture what would that mean to you if your home were organized, if it were, if it were such a way that you didn't need to come today, what would be different? And let's capture that because I want to make sure at the end that we go back and we've really addressed it. So what would, what would organized mean to you? Give me some feedback. Yes? Not as many piles all over the house. All right, I'm going to put fewer piles. <laughs> how, many would, how many of you could relate to fewer piles? Anybody? By the way, paper, in my experience of 35 years, paper is the number one organizing challenge in the household. So I'm going to talk some about it, although I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot. I do other seminars on that. Uh, but I want to give you some techniques anyway. What else? What, what would be something else that if, you, if it were the way you wanted it, what would it be? Find, find it easily. Find what you want. Find what you want easily. What else? More space. More space. And can you give me some more space meaning what would that what would more space look like? Would it mean you could park your car in the garage? What, who said more space? Okay, what would that mean, like specifically? Um, probably fewer items in the closet, so there's more necessary items in the closet. Okay, closets less stuffed. How's that? Less Is that a stuffed. fair? <laughs> yes. Mine was having a filing system that you could put an item in a place that didn't seem to have a place and what file it under. I, I file, but then I don't know what I filed it under. <laughs> oh, I, uh, <laughs> let me tell you, I, I, have, I do whole seminars on that, but let me give you one key. First of all, we call it a finding system, not a filing system. It's very easy to say, where can I put this? I can put it lots of places. The $64,000 question is where can I find it? Yeah. So simply changing your, your mental question will help you. But the key to that solution, that problem, and the issue is the same information can be filed under automobile, car, Chrysler, transportation, or vehicle, right? Doesn't matter what you call it as long as you call it the same thing each time. The key to a filing system that works or a finding system is a file index. A file index is a list of the names of your files, what you call them. You can do it as a Word document, you can do it as an Excel spreadsheet, there's software to do it, but a file index is to a filing system what a chart of accounts is to accounting. You cannot manage your money if you don't have a chart of accounts so that the same expense gets charged to the same light item each time. It's exactly the same with a file. It doesn't matter whether you call it automobile, car, Chrysler, or transportation, as long as once you call it that, you always call it that way. And what we teach people to do actually is an Excel spreadsheet where you put one column that's the, the title that you think you wanted, but then all the keywords are all the other things that you could potentially call it. And that's the way we do it. We have a whole template that we help people do that with. So a filing system. Okay, that, is that, does that make sense that you would have a file index? That last thing is what, you make, what, what gets me. What's that? Well, I make, I make um, like one name for it, you know, and or, then I think, well, does this fall under this category or, you know, where would it fall? Well, that's so where the index that? helps because yeah. it's easier to look on a piece of paper and see what you've already done because you can't flip through the files and do it. It's too, it's too, so you plan it on the, on the piece of paper itself. Then you look on the list and you see, oh, I've already got automobiles, so I don't need to make Honda. 
Do it as no No, I don't do it. Well, I don't. No, I don't do it do a death. Yeah. Okay. Well, there actually was. When I started 35 years ago, there were two organizing books. One was Stephanie Winston called Getting Organized, and there was one by Pat Dorf called File Don't Pile, which was a Dewey Decimal System for the filing system, which was the most bizarre system I've ever seen. <laughs> Anything else up here that would define for you what would organized in your household mean? Yes. Have it be pop in ready for guests. Ready for guests. Okay. Pop in ready. <laughs> Mine is 30 minutes. I'm willing for 30 minutes. My goal is I want it so that in 30 minutes I could I could put it away. And that's kind of my criteria. In fact, I have a story where I love for people, my clients, to come to my home because I define my home uh, as a productive environment, an intentional setting. And that's what this is about. I think this is about making your home an intentional place, that everything is there because it helps you accomplish your work and enjoy your life. And I love for clients to come. Well, one time there was a couple and they were going to come on a Saturday afternoon. And Saturday morning, my husband had left his glasses at the gym in, t in the town. He didn't want to go get them and I had some errands to run. I said, oh, I'll go get your glasses and run my errands. But in old true ADD fashion, I completely forgot. And I was driving around and my cell phone rings and it's my client saying, we're almost there. And I'm thinking, oh no, <laughs> this is going to be embarrassing. And then I thought, no, I'll demonstrate it. So when they walked in, it didn't look very organized. It looked like they pay you money for organization. I said, look at your watch. So they looked at their watch, and 27 minutes later, everything was put away. So that's my goal, you know. But that's a good one, ready for guests. Anything else? Yes? Um, I want to take from today a better communication system between me and my husband when we're not, like a little area of communication. Okay. Zero. Family it's like non-verbal. It's uh, where things come and go, whether it be mail or keeping track of appointments or who needs to do this and that. Family Communications Center. We call it the home office of the business of life. <laughs> That's the term that we use for that. So, All right. So these are some things that potentially you would want. So now let's take these. Let's, I want to... Stumbling blocks to that. We already talked about one, other people, right? Okay. So, <laughs> so other people. What are some of the other stumbling blocks that keep you from getting what prevents you from having the house? Time. 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 Okay. Indecision. What else? Indecision. Indecision. That's great. <laughs> Overwhelming. Uh -huh. Overwhelmed. Uh -huh. Distraction. Emotions. Emotions. Excellent. What we, got some, we got some great class participation here. Behind me I hear a big dog. But I've also got a very small baby that I'm caring for. Okay. So we're talking children and exter pets. External. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean well that that was my answer to the one before that said Get rid of your husband for the 27 minutes. Your house would be ready if you didn't have children, Hudson, and a, and a husband. <laughs> and one of, one of the things that's interesting to me is in all the years that I've organized, when I went into the houses that were in the worst condition in terms of, they did kind of look like the work on borders. I mean, there was some really, in, I can't think of a single exception of where there were cats. And that was always one of the excuses was they would have piles of paper and then the cats would mess the papers. I mean, that was a very, my friend Flo back there has been doing this for 35 years. You've, yeah, lots of cats, not just cats, but cats. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? What else? I'm I would say thing. memory. Memory. Ah, absolutely. Absolutely. Memories or lack of memories? No, memories. <laughs> memory. memory. Memory loss. Well, if I put it away, will I remember tomorrow where oh, I put it? Right. Yeah. And, and another one would be memories. Memories. So that's the, yeah, the emotions. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's the one about uh, you went to graduate school and the attic has all of the books and papers and everything from graduate school, which you know you're not going to use anymore, but it represents thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours and you poured your whole life into it. But also the little flower you talked about this morning. All right. 
from the the, the the child made for the mother when he was a baby or right. child. Right. And he's 40 years old now. Right. And that she still has hanging in her kitchen with grease all over it. And but, in the, <laughs> but in the case, the, the example of that was that wasn't intentional. I mean, it wasn't like because she no longer even saw it. You know, I mean, it was like it wasn't that she looked at it and appreciated it. It was just that it had been there so long. So one of the things I encourage you to do, and it's difficult, but I think it's really helpful, is go back and look at your house as though you've never been there before. You know, try to walk in and see it through other people's eyes. What do other people see? And then that might help you a little bit. All right, we can obviously clap for some more, but that's a good start. And, and it's an also an explanation of why this is not easy. I mean, it's, it's not. I, it's not like there's any magic button or anything else. There's no magic wands. Um, it is something that takes some time and energy. But I'm here to tell you that there's hope. I mean, once you learn something about strategies and principles, there really is some hope. My business, we brought up the issue of, um, what was it, Des decision making? Indecision. You brought up indecision. Uh, my business has been based for 35 years on clutterous postponed decisions. That's absolutely, that's absolutely true. I learned it from closed closets. Closed closets fill up because you haven't decided whether you're going to lose the 10 pounds that you're going to lose to get back into that again. And then if you did, you might want to wear it again. But the reality is, maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. You know, there's lots of ways to look at that. Some people have said, oh, you don't have anything in your closet. This, that if you haven't worn it in the last year. I have things in my closet that I've had for over 20 years, but I, they're, in, they're intentionally. It's the Hawaiian muumuu that I got 24 years ago. I probably wear it once every two years when we have some luau, but when that luau comes, I want it. And the fact that it's 24 years old means nothing to me. So I want to start at a very high level today. Because my experience is that many of us work on organization and we're putting band-aids where we really need surgery. And the place, the most important decision, in order to make all these other decisions fall into place, is what is your relationship with Jesus Christ? My goal is to help people accomplish their work and enjoy their lives. God created each and every one of us to be totally unique people with special talents and special skills to accomplish certain things. That is our work. And he intended us to enjoy our life. It makes me very sad when I talk to people and they go through this litany of horrible things and sadness and all of this and it's, it's just so depressing and I think what is the solution and the solution is Jesus he promised that he would never leave us or forsake us and that no matter what we went through he would use it to our good I have a friend who says, I open my Bible every day to see if Romans 8.28 is still there. <laughs> All things work together for good for those who love Christ and are called according to his word. And it doesn't say some things some of the time. It That's says right. all things. That's right. And one of the joys of living to be older is you get to see that. And as I look through my life, I can look at things that I thought that were just dreadful. And now I can see how God uses it. And in the most unique ways, and let me just give you one that I just thought of recently. And I guess that's what's exciting to me is I keep seeing new ways. When I was in college, one of my favorite poems was a poem called The Patchwork Quilt. And it said it makes the, takes the dark patches to make the bright patches bright. And I always loved that poem. I don't know why, but I just did. I was first considered committing suicide when I was 11 years old because I was a, a bullied child and a very sad, depressed child and had a lot of depression all through my life. And so that quilt, that, that poem was like, okay, this darkness is here for a reason. You know, I, I always kind of believed that. I caught, thought of it yesterday. I now have three clients 
who are quilters. One of them is in California, and she, her business is called Quilting as Worship. And she just, she teaches these retreats for people, and uh, she's just been won a quilt exhibit called Sacred Threads, and she's going to be distribu or being uh, exhibiting in Washington, D.C. I have another quilting client who's in Washington, D.C., and I just got a new one in Canada. But now, that's not an accident. I mean, that's... That's just an example of how God works. The fact that, that 40 years ago, I would have had this poem that I loved so much, talking about it takes the dark patches to make the bright patches bright. And that now I'm meeting these three quilters who didn't know each other before, but now they do because I've introduced them to each other. And they're in fact using the filing system that I recommend for all their quilting supplies and all that, they're thrilled and excited. It's something they've struggled with for years. And, and one of my premises is together we're better. And so one of my goals is connecting people with people that have the right kinds of answers. So the most important decision to make is who is Jesus Christ and what is his place in your life? It's kind of like putting on a blouse. If I put on a blouse and I get this first button right, all the rest of them will fall into place. Because he's the one who's going to help me know, what do I do with what you've given me? The physical things you've given me, the mind you've given me, the talents you've given me, the body you've given me. And that's where it all starts. And so I've learned that if I don't start my day touching base with God to say, what do you want me to do today, Lord? Because so many days I have my to-do list written, and some days there's nothing on it that gets done but there are some other things that I think are more important. So I encourage you to start there. Now let's talk about some principles. That's a premise. That's the premise of this that I'm hoping that you will think about because I believe that if that is in place, all the rest will fall into place. But then the second one are some principles. The first one is what I call a productive environment. A productive environment is my company. I define a productive environment as an intentional setting in which you can accomplish your work and enjoy your life. Your environment is everywhere, and it starts in your brain. If your brain is full of, I shouldn't have done that, I can't do that, that'll never work, that's not an environment in which you will accomplish your work or enjoy your life. So attitude is everything. The second thing is that organizing is an art. There is no right or wrong. People will often say to me, what should I do? And I said, that's the wrong question. The question is, what will you do? That's what we have to figure out. We have to figure out what you will do. There's so many ways to do it, and that's why after 35 years, this is still fun, because every single individual and every single company is different. God created us all uniquely, and so it's a matter of figuring out what, what will work. Um, so it's asking yourself, with the help of God, what will I do? And then having a plan for it. Then there's what I call the price principle. You know, people are always nervous when an organizing consultant comes around because they think the first thing we're going to do is say, you don't need that. I'll get rid of that. My philosophy is if in doubt, keep it. You can keep everything you want if you're willing to pay the price. And the price is time, space, money, and energy. So my job is not to decide for you whether you need it or you don't. I don't have the right to do that. Now, I'll tell you what I would do. I often say to my clients, if this, is my, if this were mine, this is what I would do. But that doesn't mean it's what you would do. But that my job is to quantify for you what it's going to cost you to keep it in terms of time, space, money, and energy so you can make a decision. And let me give you a perfect example. Many years ago, I had a client who, um, she was an amazing woman. She, had, uh, she, wrote, uh, she ran racing cars. This was in the early 80s. She uh, ran a racing car. She built computers. She quilted. Uh, she had a full-time job for the government, and she only had one arm. She did with one arm more than what wow. most people did with two. But when I went to her house, it looked like hoarders. I mean, it was unbelievable. 
And what triggered it was her mother had died and her mother left her with 22 dressers full of paper. And it had paper that had stock certificates and things like that, so it had to be gone through. So I worked with her, you know, for, for many, many months. One of the things that she had was greeting cards, hundreds of greeting cards that people had given to her. And she said, oh, I can't throw these away, you know. They're expensive and they're beautiful and they come from people that I care about and I love. And I said, okay, you know, throw them away. How do you want to organize them? And so we talked about, you know, you can organize them in baskets and boxes and all the different ways. And so ultimately it's like, all right, in order to organize them, and I don't even remember what our solution was, but we identified what the solution was. It's going to take this much space and keep in mind, and this is very important, it has to be as much space as it takes to organize what you have. But if you've accumulated this much in 10 years, then it has to be enough space to also accommodate what you're going to accumulate in the next 10 years. And that's where people get messed up. They buy something and it fits perfectly, but they don't think about, well, we're going to get more. And when you get more, they don't buy a bigger container. They just put it someplace else. And now the system is finished. Now it's gone because you're not going to find it. I see this in offices with, I can't tell you how many thousands and thousands of dollars of stationery. Somebody in an office will order stationery. There's a place on the shelf where the stationery fits. It doesn't all fit when the order comes in. So you put some of it there and then the rest of it goes back in the closet. And then three years later you're cleaning out and here's $500 worth of stationery and we just ordered a new one because we didn't know it had it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times that's happened. And it happens to us. It's why you have multiples in your pantry. You know, you got five bags of this because you, it wasn't all together. The solution, by the way, is to put one bag there with a little sign that says the excess is and then it points you to where it is. So anyway, we ultimately said it's going to take this much space, this much time, this much energy, and I said $200. Well, now some of you might say, $200 to organize greeting cards? <laughs> but $200 is, you know, a weekend trip somewhere. And she was looking at it like, okay, when I'm 80 years old, sitting down and going through all these is going to bring me lots of happy memories, and I'm going to enjoy it. And the whole purpose of organizing is so that you can accomplish your work and enjoy your life. One person might look at it and say, forget it, 200 bucks, throw it away. And somebody else is say, $200, it's a weekend out, I'll take it. That's the art of organizing. It's a matter of figuring out how much it's going to cost you. And then finally, there's what I call Hemphill's principle. You can keep everything you want. If in doubt, keep it. But there's Hemphill's principle. If you don't know you have it or you can't find it, it is of no value to you. So that's the real thing and that addresses one of the find whatever you want easily. Not only should you be able to find it, but other people should if you're not there. I mean if something that somebody else needs, ultimately they need to be able to find it as well. And then finally the last principle, and this is also an important one, in every organizing process things will feel worse before they get better. So many times somebody says, okay, I'm going to clean out this closet. And you go in and you start pulling things out and you find something in this closet and it belongs over in this closet. So you walk over to that closet and you start pulling things out and then you go back and you find something that goes in the laundry room and then you start pulling it out and then the next thing you know you've got a mess everywhere. <laughs> and I mean it's just terrible and so you shove it all back in. Well, there's a couple of practices. We're talking about principles versus practices, okay? One of the principles here is that for every hour of organizing, allow 10 minutes for cleanup. So if you say, I'm going to work on organizing my closet for an hour before I go to work in the morning, that means I'm going to organize for 50 minutes, but for 10 minutes, I'm going to go put back the things that go somewhere else. So if I pull it out of the closet, I'm doing one shelf, I pull it out of the closet and I find something that goes in the laundry room. I don't walk into the laundry room so that I get distracted. I put it on the floor, scribble a little label on it that says this is going to the laundry room, this needs to go to the garage, this is giveaway, this is whatever, and it's going to get messy. It's going to look messier because you're putting it out, but you're going to have labels on it. And then you've got 10 minutes before you leave to work to go take that to the garage and take that somewhere else. It makes all the difference in the world. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
Are you just putting it in those places, or are you putting it where it belongs in those places? No, well, in the if I'm organizing for an hour, uh -huh. right, okay, in the 50 minutes, I'm taking something out, and I'm saying, is this does this belong here? First of all, do I want to keep it? And then I say, yes, I want to keep it, but it doesn't belong here. It really needs to go into the garage. So then I would put it on the floor and scribble a note that says garage, and I'd put it on that file. But, but the, when I, my, my thing was in the 10 minutes, are you doing just moving that to the garage and just sticking it? Yes. It doesn't have to be no. done anything with it. That's okay. another project. Okay. That's, okay. <laughs> because then if you try to do that, then that, and that's what happens. That's exactly what happens. You have to focus. And you know, if you think about it, all of life's problems are related to us not focusing. Focus is really key. And that's what happens. We get distracted. So you're going to pick one and finish it. All right, so some other practices. Clutters postpone decisions. So let's talk about paper, because everybody talked about paper being a really big problem. Here's the good news about paper. There's only three decisions you can make about a piece of paper. Any piece of paper anywhere in your life. File, act, or toss. If you want to clear the fat, file, act, or toss. If you want to clear the fat from your life, you can file, act, or toss. File means I don't know if I will ever need this again, but I do not have the guts to throw it away. <laughs> so you're going to put it in a reference file, and you're going to have an index so that when you file it, you can go to the index and you'll be able to find it. Act means the ball is in my court to do it. This is a bill I need to pay. This is a phone call I need to make. This is a letter I need to write. This is a discussion I need to have. And so then you need to have a way to manage those papers. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then toss is love, obviously the last one. File act toss. So when you go home and you see papers around, you can think, okay, I've only got three choices. And you can start by having a place to put the filing and you just put it there and then we'll deal with filing separately. But at least you're going to get all the filing together. And then if you look at it and you say, okay, I have to do this, well, you can put all the action together and then that's where to Amanda's point, that's where you want to have what I call the home office of the business of life, is where you do that stuff, which everybody needs. Then we come to what I call the art of waste basketry. <laughs> Research shows, and I have proven it over and over and over again, that 80% of what we keep, we never use. Go check it out. Look at the spices in your spice drawer. Look at the utensils in your kitchen. Look at the tools in your garage. Look at the DVDs in your DVD collection, the clothes in your closet, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, does that mean you get The question, of course, is what's the 20% you're going to use? So here's what I want to say to you. It's not an all or nothing kind of a thing. It's a way of educating yourself along the way. And I want to give you some ways, uh, some ways that you can do that. There's a, what's on there is the art of waste basket. I'm not going to go all, all through the de all the details of it, but the bottom line question is, what's the worst possible thing that would happen if I didn't have this? So here, let's talk about paper in particular. If I threw this out and it turned out I was wrong, I would have to, and then you fill in the blanks, and then you say, is that a price I'm willing to pay? It's not a moral issue. It's a matter of, does this help me accomplish my work or enjoy my life? I'll never forget the time I was working with a client and we were doing our closets. And I pulled out something and I said, how does this make you feel? And she looked at me kind of, I mean, we were looking at a piece of clothing, you know, and I said, how does it make you feel? She said, well, it makes me feel guilty. I said, you don't need it. If there's anything in your life, any of this stuff that makes you feel sad, guilty, angry, frustrated, whatever, I don't think it serves you. It doesn't help you accomplish your work or enjoy your life. You don't need it. Life is too short. Your, your environment should be surrounded by things that lift you up, not drag you down. So how does it make me feel is a very good thing to answer. Now, why is it difficult to get rid of things? Give me some examples. Why is it hard to get rid of things? I might use it someday. I might use it someday. Mm -hmm. okay. Somebody gave it to me. Somebody gave it to me. That's a real big one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Or you might have paid a lot for it. Or you paid a lot for it. 
difficult. The effort we, that other people put into things <laughs> always gets me. I struggle with throwing away magazines with you know good articles or handouts from church from a Bible study, you know, yeah, things like that. It, so those are good. Ex those are good examples. I struggle with get, throwing things that other people have worked out, articles and things like that. One of the things to keep in mind is this is about being the best that you can be. You know, there's lots of people. I mean, I'm a I'm avid reader. I mean, just absolutely avid. I just love to read. I buy books all the time. I always have. Now I have physical books and I have online books and I mean it's just. It's unbelievable how much there, are, you know, how many there are. And one time I realized that I had all these books, and the bookshelves were just getting fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller, and it's like this can't go on. And then I realized that some of those books I knew I would never read again. Some books I read over and over and over because I'm at a different point in my life, and and they're where I am. But others, it's like once I read them, it's like okay, I know what it is. I don't need to read. So I'm thinking, now why is it, when I know I'm not going to read this anymore, why is it so difficult for me to give it away? Memory. <laughs> I wanted the books because I wanted to remember that I'd read them. I said, ah, there's a solution to that. I'll index them. So I took an Excel spreadsheet and I wrote down the name of the book, the name of the author, and then a couple of comments about the book, what I liked about it or what I didn't like about it or where I got it or just anything. And so then when I'm talking to somebody, my database has 13,000 people in it, so I'm, and those are all people that I've connected with in the last 35 years. So I'm always having conversations that's like, oh, I know I read something about that or I know there was something in there. Well, now I can go to my database and look it up. I can do a search. It helped me immensely. Then I was able to take all the books and give them to the Clayton Library that raises their, which my mother-in-law was one of the founders of it. They raise money every year from the books that they sell, and it was like a win-win. I'm honoring my mother-in-law. I'm getting rid of the books. I'm opening up my bookshelf space, and I, and I still have the information, which is what I really wanted. Um, so it's a matter of, is this helping you? You're not in the business of taking care of other people, not as it relates to a gift. And one of the things I think about gifts is, if gifts become a burden, something's gone haywire. You know, when someone gives you a gift, the idea is that they loved you enough to do it, but if the gift becomes a burden, doesn't that kind of seem like it, that it's screwy? Yes? I have gotten to where when I give a, something to someone along that way, I tell them, in a couple of years, I don't want to see this anymore. I want to see that you've gotten rid of it. Uh -huh. Enjoy it for the moment, but then get rid of it. I, my feelings won't be hurt. I just have such a feeling that that's what's going to happen. They, I used to do that with things my mother gave me, yeah. and it was so difficult until I, I replaced one thing one time hanging on a wall above our bed, and she came to me about two weeks later, and she said, thank goodness I wondered when you were going to get rid of it. <laughs> and I had held on to it because she gave it to me, and I thought her feelings would be hurt. So now that's, I do that within family so, especially. And isn't that such an example of how we behave in certain ways because we assume other people will think of something and the assumptions are totally wrong? So what would be another way to play that? Another way to play it would be to say, to, and it's going to be different with every person, so I'm not saying this is the solution every time, but another way is to say, you gave me this and I really enjoyed it, but at this point it doesn't fit with my decor or it doesn't whatever else and I would like to give it to so-and-so, would that be okay with you? Or something like that, you know, and I remember I was hired by a um, retirement community to come in and help people with downsizing, you know, because the number one reason there are people who want to move out of their house into a smaller space, into a space where they don't have lawns, the number one reason they keep is they don't want to do with their stuff. And so they hired me to come in and help people with downsizing, and one of the questions I said was, ask your children what is it of yours that they would really like to have and they might have it now or you might on uh, when my husband's mother died on the back of all the furniture said this belongs to Alfred this belongs to Brian. And it was wonderful it was absolutely wonderful and one man said my husband my son said all he wanted was my wallet <laughs> I mentioned to you that paper was the number one challenge in people's houses and and I've seen that over and over and over again and uh, a number of years ago, I was involved in developing some software. And prior to releasing the software, 
I organized 200 individual offices. Some of them were home offices. And I know that everybody's different, but I just had the feeling that there were some things that were non-negotiable, that some things had to be in place. And as a result of this, I developed something called the Magic Six. If you see it down in the left-hand corner, you will see this. And I want to talk about how in your home, you need to have what I call the home office for the business of life. That's a place where you pay your bills, you write your thank you notes, you deal with consumer issues, you deal with, it's a thing, it's where you do the business of life. And the number one thing about that spot is it must be a place you like to be. Because most of the things you're doing there are things you don't like doing. So if you're taking things you don't like to do and you're trying to be, do them in a place you don't like to be, you're going to procrastinate all the more. So that place can be a variety of things. Many of you, I suspect, work from your dining room table or your kitchen table. That's okay. There are ways you can do that, but you still need all of the magic six in place. So I just wanted to highlight what the magic six is so you can at least know that you need to have all of these. And this magic six needs to be in reach of where you're sitting. So when you're sitting at the kitchen counter, if you're working at the kitchen table, or if you're sitting in wherever it is that's your space, you need to reach these six things. The first thing is the desktop, the things on the desktop where you sort. The most common is in, out, and file. In means I haven't looked at it yet. It's the mail you've taken out of the mailbox, you're putting in there, it hasn't been sorted yet. Or in my case, it's the stuff that Alfred gives to me and says, here, I thought you'd want to look at that. And it goes in there. The deal is, if it goes in there, if you pull it out, it's got to go someplace else. That's not a place to put postponed decisions. It's not pulling it out and say, oh, I don't feel like dealing with that today and putting it back in. That's where it goes wrong. <laughs> then out means it needs to go someplace else. It needs to go to the mailbox. I need to give it to my husband. I need to take it someplace else. Frequently, that space is going to be empty. But if you don't have that space, then there's no place to put it. Then that means the mail that's supposed to go to the mailbox goes on the corner of the desk. Somebody else comes in and dumps something on the corner of the desk, and now you didn't mail the American Express card bill because it was buried somewhere. And then file means it needs to go in the file cabinet, and probably you can't reach the file cabinet. So it goes in file so that when that's full or once a week or once a month or whatever, you actually file. So that's desktop files. The second one is your wastebasket, recycle, and shred. Third one's your calendar, and calendar is so important. <laughs> and you know why else the calendar is important? You know, it's been said, and it's really true. You can say what's important to you in your life, but if you really want to know what, what you're making important in your life, you look at two things, your calendar and your bank account. And if your calendar and your bank account do not reflect what you're saying it means for you to accomplish your work and enjoy your life, then you've got a problem. And that's a real key problem. I mentioned that I was working with this quilter. I've never met her before. We work, I do telephone coaching. And at one point we were working and she said, I have to stop for a minute because she said, I realized something. I'm not clear about what my work is right now. And you know, a lot of us get in the, into that, into that uh, rut. What is your work? What is it that God, what talents did he give you? What skills did he give you? That is your work. And the possibilities are endless. But what's really important is that you need to know that. And you know what a really good key is to it? When you were like seven, eight, nine years old, what were you doing? When I train consultants, I train them to manage time, space, and information. But then when they come into the program, the next thing I do is, for whom? Who is it that you want to do this for? And one of the ways we find that is, what were you doing when you were seven, eight, and nine years old? I'll tell you one of the things I was doing. I lived in the second floor of a tenant farmhouse. And the only space that I had that was my own was just a little tiny cupboard that my, it was a closet, and then there was a cupboard that my daddy had built for me. And my mother worked at a jewelry store. And she would bring home the boxes that were slightly bent that they couldn't use at the jewelry store anymore. And so as a 
seven, eight year old, I was always trying to fit those boxes into that little cupboard. And as we were sorting the music in the music room this morning, I thought that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm figuring out, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. How am I putting those, those all together? And then my mother laughed when I asked her, I said, I don't remember what was I doing. She says, oh, she said, you used to gather the family in grandma's parlor and you preached to her. <laughs> and I said, what am I doing? I'm preaching organizing. That's what I was put on earth to do. And it's never too late to figure out what that is. Never. There are many, many stories of people who didn't figure that out until they were 70, 80, 90 years old. And it can still be done. And that's the real key to organization. Organization in and of itself has no value. It is a skill to help you do what God intended you to do, to accomplish your work and enjoy your life. So the calendar is really important. I brought along, I'm a user of a calendar called a planner pad. I've used it for decades. Uh, I've used it for over a decade. Then the computer electronics came in. I said, okay, you know, I need to be... I need to be modern, and so I tried using an electronic calendar, and the longer I used it, the more stressed I got, and after about two and a half years, I called Bill Crossan, who owns Planner Pad, and I said, okay, Bill, I'm coming back. I said, I, I really need this paper, and I said to him, do you have any idea how many people you get like that? And he said, we average about seven to 8,000 a year who try electronic and come back. Well, now I am actually do use both. My electronic calendar is my master calendar because I have to communicate it with other people. But this is where my to-dos are. Nothing, whenever anybody says do this or do that, that's where it is. And if you don't have a calendar that you like, I encourage you to come up afterwards and look at this one. I'll tell you why I like it and why, why it's unique. It comes in two sizes. It comes in that size and it comes in this size. Uh, and it actually, the comp I don't sell them, so I'm not making any money on it. They, um, they come quarterly, so you could buy one now that would start uh, for the last, half of the, the last half of the year. All right, and then you have contact management. That's simply names, addresses, and phone numbers. And when you go into people's houses, you see post-it notes and business cards and scraps of paper and backs of envelopes and quarters of napkins that have names, addresses, and phone numbers. And so everybody needs a place to capture that. And it's really important as you grow older, too, because in getting these systems, notice at the top I have the word system, saving you space, time, energy, and money. Anytime you have something you have to do over and over, and that's why on that scorecard, I identified all the different places. You need systems for laundry, you need systems for health insurance, you need systems for cooking, you need systems for photographs, you need systems, all those things, because they're all things that you do over and over and over again. So that's why there needs to be a system for each one of them. So contact management is really important. You can do it in paper, you can do it electronic. There's a million different ways, but let me tell you how we help clients do it. If somebody had trouble with contact management, we'd start by saying, what's your vision? If you had a system to manage names, addresses, and phone numbers that worked, how would, what would it look like? You know, do you want paper or do you want electronic? Do you want, what would it, how would it have to function in order to be successful? And then we say, well, what are the obstacles to that? And then what are the resources to that? And then when you give us that information, your vision, that's you. Nobody owns that except you. The obstacles, you own that, but I probably know some you don't know because I've been doing it long enough that I know that if you try that, it's probably not going to work because this is what's going to happen. And the same with resources. You may know some resources, but I probably know some too, or I know somebody else who knows some. So then we're saying in order to reach this vision, overcoming these obstacles with these resources, now we're going to design and execute the plan. And then the fifth one is sustain your success. Notice the common word in each one of those steps? Your. It's got to work for you. It's not what should I do, it's what will I do. And when we figure out what you will do, then you're going to be on the right step. So that's the way it is with the calendar, with the contact management system. And then number four, or number um, five is the action files. And that means the ball is in my court. That's the bills I'm going to pay, the letters I'm going to write, the family reunion I'm planning, uh, whatever the projects are. And there are different ways that you can manage them. One of my favorite ways is we have a product that we call the Swift file. That says 29 because it's for today. So the pieces of paper that are in this day are the pieces of paper that I need for today. So if you have clutter on the kitchen counter, most of those pieces of paper on the kitchen counter you need on a particular day. You know those Belks flyers that come all the time? 
I stick it in on the day of the sale and I'll move it for three or four days. 99% of them I never use. But if all of a sudden it's like, oh, I need to go so and so and I need such and such and I'm going by Belks and here's a 30% off, I can grab it and I know exactly where it is. So doing it by date means that you have it exactly on the day you need it. And Alfred and I, my husband and I figured out, and he, he's not, as I told you, not an organized person. He said, that's why I married you. Um, so whenever he comes back from a meeting and he has a doctor's appointment or something, like that, he'll hand it to me. He said, would you remind me to take the car in or were you doing? It's like, it's easy for me. I don't care. So he gives me the piece of paper and I'll stick it in the date. Uh, if it's months in advance, so maybe it's in September. I'll come back and say, I have a doctor's appointment in September. So it goes in September. I use recycled paper. Like he'll give me a little scrap of paper. I'll take the little scrap of paper, I staple it onto a big recycled piece of paper, I stick it in September. When September comes, everything out of September gets spread in 1 through 31 so that it's on, and it goes in the Saturday before the appointment because that's when he plans his next week and he has a pad on the kitchen. So the Saturday before, I hand it to him and then get, it works perfectly. It's no trouble to me, it's great comfort to him, and it's like that's what marriage is about. And the last thing is, um, Reference files. So in the magic six, and this is my challenge to you, if you go back to your house, pick up a piece of paper from anywhere, I don't care where it is, every single one of those pieces of paper goes in one of those six places. So if you go back to your house and there's a piece of paper you don't know what to do with, it means you're missing something out of the magic six. All right, I, yeah, one other thing, I didn't give you a handout for this, but I want to mention this because it's really important. It's something I do with companies on a very large basis, but it's also true for families. Every family needs to answer what I call the seven information management questions. First one is, what information do I need to keep? And you can think about this also in terms of, what information do I need to have available in case something happens to me, in case I'm disabled, or in case I die, uh, my goal, you know, I told you about your one thing. Well, my one thing for this year is to clean up any mess I have so that in case something happens to me, if my children come in, they're going to know exactly what they need to know. So it's really helped me pare down. I've gotten rid of tons and tons of stuff because I didn't want them to have to deal with it. And I'm trying to answer these seven information management questions. So the first one is what information do I need to keep? Or if you're talking about a family, what information would they need? And there are lots and lots of products and books out there. Again, if you want help with that, I would take this five steps and say, okay, what, you know, do you want it electronically? Do you want it in different ways? And we'd help you figure it out. The second one is, what information do I need to keep? Second is in what form? You want paper or electronic? Sometimes you want both. For how long? The reason I wrote my first book, Taming the Paper Tiger, was because people asked me the question, how long do you keep bank statements? What's the purpose of a bank statement? Reconcile, Reconcile your checkbook, right? Do you have any idea how many tens of thousands of boxes of bank statements I've seen under, <laughs> under beds, in attics, in garages, by people who never balance their checkbook once? <laughs> And when you ask them why they're keeping it, it's because it has numbers on it. The IRS wants it. No, they don't. They really don't. Uh, so that's when you play out the what's the worst possible thing that would happen if I didn't have this. If I got, if I got rid of this, what would I have? Well, your answer is you can get, the bank would get it for you. They'd charge you for it. Okay? So one person would say, man, I pay that bank enough. I'm not paying anything. If you have enough space, keep it. No problem. On the other hand, if you don't have space and the chances are only one out of 999 that you're going to need it, then you may say, I'm going to take the risk and I'll buy it from the bank if I need it. So that's where you want to play it out. That's the decision making part. So what information do you want to keep? In what form? For how long? Who's responsible for filing it? Who needs access to it? How can you find it? So that's like, okay, is there a file index? Is there a notebook somewhere? Do you have it indexed on the computer? What we're doing is we, I have a program that's in the cloud, for those of you who know that term, and everything that my family needs to know is in that cloud, 
and my children know the password to it and they're very tech savvy so all they have to know is that password and they can go in and do a keyword search about anything practically and you know if they do life insurance Barbara all that will come up if they do bank accounts all that will come up if they do whatever that's where the computer's good because it gives you that flexibility of being able to search on the other hand other people prefer a notebook I just bought one somebody came from Canada the other day and brought me this book that her friend had developed which was a book like that where you take all those questions and the key is you put it in pencil because things are going to change I mean you're going to change banks or whatever so it doesn't matter you can have it either way either one is possible just pick one what information you're going to keep in what form for how long who's responsible for filing it how can you find it uh, who needs access to it and the last one is are you backing it up and you know we had experiences right here when that tornado tornado came uh, if you have it in paper and it's only one form and it's gone it may be gone forever on the other hand my dearest friend from my husband's dearest friend and he just lost his whole computer and he had all his taxes on it and he didn't have it backed up and it's like the only thing between you and a computer crash is time so if you've got your stuff backed up on a, on a computer you've got to better make sure that you got it backed up somewhere because it's going to go away so those are the seven information questions that everybody needs to answer all right I want to allow time for questions and answers so let me just um, I want to show a couple of other things I want to mention this as a tool I'm big into tool my daddy on the farm used to say uh, half of any job is having the right tool and probably 80% of what we do is help people choose or use tools often we're helping them use the ones they already have they bought software or they bought or, or we're changing around I have to tell you a funny story I bought a briefcase I'm really picky about my briefcases and I bought one oh, it's not that one I bought one and it had a whole bunch of pockets in it and I hated it because every time I would go to get something I couldn't remember which pocket and I was going to give it away and then I thought wait a minute that's what glue's for and so I took this leather handbag that was really pretty and I took the glue and I glued some of those shut and it works just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I love index cards and here's a bit of trivia. One index card is less expensive than one post-it note. So I have index cards everywhere. They're in my car, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, beside the chair in the TV room, in my briefcase. And in fact, in my briefcase, I have a little leather holder that I carry. And then the holder is the size of an index card, and it's in three components. And the middle component is where I put blank index cards. The outside component are my own business cards and Bible verses I'm trying desperately to memorize. And the outside are the ones I'm processing. So if I'm talking with you and you say, Barbara, will you tell me such and such? I'll take one of these out, I'll scribble on here, and I'll stick it in that outside pocket. Then when I get back, I'll say, okay, when am I going to do that? I'm going to do that next Wednesday. I'll go find the calendar for that Wednesday. I'll take this and stick it in there, although I attach it to an 8 half by 11 piece of paper because I don't put any pieces of paper in here. Or sometimes I may just write it on my calendar when I'm going to do it, or I may do it right at that moment, but that's the way I do it. So I call these next action cards. Hmm. And the key is you only want one item per card. They're cheap, so you can do that. And the reason for that is it's easy to process. So you can write one item on the card and then you can put it by the door so you remember it when you go out. You can hand it to another member of the family. You can stick it someplace and then I cross it off and I even recycle the cards. So sometimes they look you know, kind of crazy, but I love it. It's so much better than a post-it note, which just gets stuck and lost and everything else. So I use these uh, all the time. So it's another one of my favorite tools that I wanted to show you. Let's take some time for some questions and answers. So, I mean, I could talk about this for days. Yes? Would you mind just briefly going over the seven things you mentioned at the end? I want to make sure I have all the yes. seven questions. What information do I need to keep? Okay. In what form? Mm -hmm. For how long? Who's responsible for filing it? Okay. Okay. Who needs access to it? How do we find it? And how is it backed up? Okay. And those seven questions, I work with businesses. Every business needs to answer those seven questions, no matter what size they are. 
but also families do. And those are questions to, that families put together to be able to, for family members to know what they need to. Thank you. Yes? If we have uh, boxes of old files and we need them shredded, is there, do you know, a place we can take them? Yeah. It's a nice garner. Uh, the UPS place right across this, the road will do it. Um, I would think if you go, there are different places that do it at different times. Different towns have recycling days and things like that. So you might just go on to Google and do recycling and see what comes out. There are lots of different options, different times. Okay, and could you repeat your principal pencils? Yes, if you don't know you have it or you can't find it, it is of no value. Yes. What about organizing photographs when you don't really know what the, the end result you want is going to be? Then you, you can't. It's, I know you have to. You have to finally decide. But I don't do scrapbooking. I, I've taken them all out of the photo books and put them in boxes. <coughs> I just want something small. It could maybe be on the computer. It could be a physical. Should I have both? Some, you know, have it on saved on the computer. Have it saved in. Well, that's you know, where form. that's where I would use this step process. I and you said what you don't know what. You, you're not sure what you want. And until you're sure what you want, it's impossible to organize. I mean, that really, that's just the, that's the key. You know, it really is the key. Um, I mentioned to you my client saying, you know, I have to stop right now because I'm not sure what my work is. So she took two or three weeks out and got recentered again, and then she called back and said, okay, I got it clear, I'm ready to go. And oh, she's just made massive progress. And some people say they don't know what, a comp they don't know what enjoying their life is. I invited Florence Feldman, is my best friend for 30 years, she's back there. All of this that you see over there is her artwork and it's one of the things that she's done to enjoy her life. It's something that's evolved. I didn't start until I was 65. Yeah. Now, the first one she did when she was 65. Um, and I asked her to bring it along because I thought it was such a beautiful story. I've known her for so many years and this has just opened up a whole new world. Uh, for her. She's also the author of a video, and she didn't bring her cards along, but I want to tell you a website that you would want to check. It's a very short video. But she took care of her mother for um, six and a half years who had dementia, and she developed a video called Life in Reverse, lifeinreversevideo.com, and it's a beautiful, beautiful video. Uh, and that's her work. So there's a, a, her enjoying, and then her work is partly that. She's also an organizing consultant and she and I just worked on the client together this week. We have been doing it for many years. So I invite you to see that as well. So I don't know that that answered your question except that it, it is the truth. The truth is, and here's another principle actually. You can have anything you want probably, but not everything. <laughs> and you can have everything if you're willing to pay the price. So uh, let me tell you a story about a client I had with photographs. You went into her family room and there was a huge trunk. And it was full of photographs. They weren't in any order. They were just dumped in there. And it would just make some people's skin crawl. And her two granddaughters came over. And they sat down on the floor with her. And they pulled out the pictures. And she told them stories. And that's all she cared about. So one of the questions about anything you're trying to organize is, why does this matter? My mother-in-law. She wanted her photographs organized for posterity, okay? So that meant acid-free paper and labeling and all of that. And so it's really, and you can't do it for anybody else. I mean, you can only do what you think is best. Like you know if your children have expressed something so you think it's likely they'll want something and you want to help satisfy that, you can. But how many times? It's like the story you told. You, the picture you kept for years because you thought your mother wanted to and your mother said, I, I want you to get rid of that. It's like, whatever happened to communication? You know, so that's part of it. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Is that helpful yeah. at all? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I used to be a creative memories consultant. Okay. And they have a program that would help you. I have a box, one of their black boxes. That okay. You can mm -hmm. I have all mine on computer. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, you know, one program, I've got over 10,000 pictures on my computer. And I have all the family pictures and everything, and so all I have to do is take a flash drive and make them all a copy, and they they have one too. We don't have to go print out pictures. 
they're just so, I mean, the ways that you can do it is absolutely endless. I'll tell you what for me was the huge solution for photographs. And that's these digital photo frames. Oh, yeah. Because one of the things that frustrates me about pictures is you take all this time and energy to do it, and then you never see them, whether they're electronic or in paper. You don't see them. Well, when my mother was in a nursing home, her grandson did that for her. And he brought it to her. And it was like such a joy. And I thought, wait a minute, I can do that at home. So when you walk into my office, there's a digital frame up there. And the thing I love about it is the photos come through in no particular order. So one day I'm looking at the, the girl who's 11 who was three months. And, you know, it's like I never know whether it's going to be a business picture or whatever. And it just brings me such, such joy. Because for me, it's like I want to be able to use them. I'm not interested in, I'm not, I have very little interest in either the past or the future. It's right now. What am I doing right now? And that really helps me. So my parents had accumulated boxes of pictures and so in order not to pass those boxes of pictures down to my sister and I, they are taking the time to uh, identify who they are and, and they're all in like my dad's doing his side and my mother's doing wow. her side. What a and gift. They're and so them. they'll be in like photo albums and, and then the ones that, you know, if they're duplicates or so that's what they're doing with them, just as an idea. One of the things that um, is, is helpful is a lot of times there are older people who would like to do stuff, but they just don't have the energy anymore. They just don't have the interest, they don't have the energy or whatever. And if you have children, one of the very best gifts you can give to your children is to say to your children, you know, I wanted, I had good intentions, you know, I took all these photographs and I collected them with really good intentions. I never got them the way I wanted them. And whatever you do with them is just fine. That is the most wonderful gift you can give your children because I cannot tell you how many times I have sat with people as they sobbed because they had all of this stuff that they had accumulated, not just photographs, but all kinds of other stuff. And they felt like they were betraying, they're grieving the loss of the family member, and then they're betraying them at the same time. And it really is a burden. And that goes back, in fact, I read this morning, I'll see if I can find it. Okay. Um, in 2 Samuel 10, uh, tells the story of Samuel was being appointed uh, or Samuel was appointing Saul king and he couldn't find him and Samuel said to the Lord where is Saul and this is the King James version of the Bible and the Lord answered behold he hath hid himself among the stuff <laughs> many of us are hiding in our stuff Yes, um, I have done for a couple of years, our children in laws and their children and their spouses will give us stuff that we don't need. We're not collecting <coughs> stuff anymore. And I have a little trunk in the dining room and on Thanksgiving they have to go shopping in my mall <laughs> and pick out something that they want. And it's been real interesting because they'll pick out something that somebody else gave me and they'll go, but I gave you that. I said, oh, but Mary Beth likes it better. Isn't that wonderful? And so we've got the kids understanding that we're through our stuff days. You know, share it with others. Don't, don't exactly. push it on us. One of the things that, that people getting rid of things, you know, it's hard. Part of it is it's expensive and it's valuable. You know, it's about, people paid a lot of money for it. And that's where I'm thrilled. Like, we support Harbor Inc., which is the Johnson County domestic violence. They take that stuff and they, they use everything. They absolutely figure out a way. And that's such a blessing. Um, I just had a funny thing happen. I was years ago in Washington, D.C. I was working with a client and she had two daughters and she had a mink coat. And the daughters were becoming environmentalists and they wouldn't let her wear the mink coat. And so she said to me, would you like my mink coat? And I said, I love it. So I took it and it's in my closet right now. Now in Raleigh, you don't wear mink coats too often. But I've worn it a couple of times in the past five years, I guess. Well, her parents, the, these parents just died, and I wrote a note to the daughters, and I said, remember that mink coat you didn't want your mother to wear? Well, it's still in my closet, and I'm enjoying it. So, you know, I think this is about getting things in the right place so that they really are enjoying it. When we have stuff that becomes a burden to us, I guarantee you that there's somebody very close to you that would be blessed 
uh, by having that same thing and it would be. Yeah. I also think you have to remember that your children will be so much happier if the closets are cleaned out when they have <laughs> That's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> yes. Um, one thing I had trouble letting go of is my children's projects that they made in school. Right. I just didn't have a heart to throw them away because mm -hmm. I, I, I wanted to scrub everything they make, even if it looks pretty silly. So one thing we, we did over Christmas this year was I had them go through their stuff, but we took pictures of it and threw it in the trash, and it was so mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, and my son is in the process of putting all these pictures on a, a computer disc for me. It's not much bigger than my phone, and it holds tons of videos, all the videos. I have boxes and boxes. Um, my nickname is Flash Cube. Thousands and thousands of pictures, and he's in the process of putting them all, scanning them all into a, 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 a removable hard drive, I guess. I'm not, I'm not sure what you call it, but. Anyway, I have pictures of their school projects that were sometimes some of them were big or yeah. just anyway, that was something that we I mean I'm learning to let it go. And the other thing is I'm having not instead of holding on to it because somebody gave it to me or they made it or whatever, I just take a picture of it. And then I think that um, digital photo frame is something that's gonna be in my future. Okay, I good. Do, because I do want to remember yeah. I do want to remember these things. Not let them go. But. A, a lot of times people have collections that they started and they liked them at one point but then they kind of got out of control and yes. people kept giving them to them and so taking pictures of those collections is a good way. Yeah. One of my friends right now has her father has a Wedgwood collection. I mean it's worth a fortune and there's nobody in the family that wants it. I mean not, and so she's trying to figure out you know a way. It, it does become a challenge to get rid of things. So. Yeah. Well, I hope, let's look at what we put, we talked about fewer piles. So have you identified some things for those of you who had that, that you could do it? We talked about finding what you want easily. Indexing is related to paper, but in terms of physical things, labeling is also very important. A good example is if you have a linen closet and you have different size sheets, it will make all the difference in the world if you simply put a label that says double sheets, queen sheets, and does it mean they're always going to get in the right place? No, but it means it's a lot easier to get it back there. In fact, one of my definitions of whether or not something is organized, there's four questions. I haven't put this down. I don't think I'm in your handout either. So number one is, does it work? You know, is what you're doing working, whether it's your calendar or your linen closet or the, the com compartment in your car, whatever it is, does it work? The second is, do you like it? And I think about my favorite stories. I had a client who was a... Um, uh, CFO of a movie production company and I went into his office and there were piles around but when I looked at it it just looked to me like they were done by projects and some people organize that way I mean, it's not necessarily bad so I didn't think it was a bad thing I just figured these were his different projects and he looked at it he says he said it works I can find it but he said I don't like it he said I'd really like to have a clean desk but he said every time I have a clean desk I can't find anything <laughs> So in his case, the file index was the answer. We actually went to a numerical filing system. And he said, for as long as I can remember, I spent one Saturday a month coming in, cleaning up my desk and my, my office. He said, I'll never have to do that again. Because we gave him a simple filing system so that he could file it easily and find it. Not just file it, but find it. The third question is, does it work for others? Does it work for the people you care about? So, you know, in so many families, there's this push and pull. And it just, there's no value in it. You know, it's not a godly way to behave. We need to figure out what it is that we can do to make some compromise. So when you come to my house, it'll be clear to you what parts are mine and what parts are my husband, and it's okay. You know, it's his house too. Now, if his stuff gets <coughs> over, kind of like an amoeba, if it grows over, then we might have a discussion. But you know, we've learned to live with it. And then the last question, and this one I think is the really important one, and often people don't understand it, but I want to explain it, is can you recover quickly? Can you recover quickly? And what I mean by that, life is messy. Life happens. You know, you're doing things and then you get sick or you have company or you get a new job or you lose a job or whatever and things just get out of control. It happens to everybody all the time. If you have a system, it's easy to recover. It's like when the couple came to my house and it was messy, 27 minutes later, it was picked up because I had a system. 
And that's the reason I gave you this scorecard. I really encourage you to go back and fill out this scorecard so you can identify where you need systems. And if you want help with it, we do telephone coaching. We can schedule a 30 minute phone coaching call to just say, let's talk about this. Let's talk about laundry. Let's talk about photographs. Let's talk about whatever. And that helps you. It's hard to brainstorm yourself. It's hard to get out of your, out of your window. And it helps to bring somebody else in. So don't be stuck because God intended you to accomplish your work and enjoy your life. And we'd like to help you do that. So I thank you for coming. You're welcome to come up and look at these things. I'm not going anywhere, so if you have questions that you didn't get answered, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.